Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. It truly is a blessing to be here once again to see all of you and to see some new faces. I pray that your faith will be strengthened and that, uh, that our trust in God and our reliance upon him will only be affirmed this morning as we read God's word and study what he has given to us. So we read in our scripture reading from the book of Amos chapter 8, and we read verse 11 and 12. However, I want to draw attention to verse 9, because before he tells us about the famine that's coming, and before we're told that it's not going to be a famine of bread and water, and it's not going to just be a famine limited to a certain area, geography, but the, we're told later in verse 11 that it's going to be all over, verse 12, from the north even to the south, from the east to the west. But before God introduces that, he tells us in verse 9 of Amos chapter 8, and it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and it will darken the earth in the clear day. That's pointing us to Matthew chapter 24 and the signs of the end time. This generation, the generation that will exist just prior to the second coming of Jesus. So it's a message for this hour. It has a present day application now as the preaching of the gospel is supposed to be uh, penetrating every aspect in every area of our globe. But it also has an application when probation closes. We're going to look at both. But we can see that there's an effort that is being made, not just a human effort, a supernatural, superhuman effort designed by the enemies of God's word to keep and to prevent the truth from reaching the people. That's what we see described in these verses. Uh, there's a motion, there's a plan that has been set into motion to keep uh, you from hearing the words of the Lord. And in these last days, there's great effort to keep the Bible truth away from the common people. It's nothing new. Uh, ever since God began to declare his word in the Garden of Eden, what did the serpent do? He began to counter and contradict and to question the word of God. And so instead of embracing and being established, and I pray that our faith that we have uh, embraced when becoming members of the Remnant Church, I hope that faith is reaffirmed in your life this morning. But the very things that God gave to his people, to Adam and Eve, those are the very things that Satan attempted to cause the holy pair to ignore, to reject. Uh, he questioned and contradicted what God said. Since day one, that's been our case. You can also see all throughout the scriptures, Jeremiah, right? God gave him a message. He wrote it in a scroll. It was a message to the king, to the nation. It was given to the, those in leadership position. And what did the king do to Jeremiah's scroll on one occasion? He burnt it, destroyed it, didn't want to hear of it. We also see the Sanhedrin, right, in the days of the apostles, where they commanded, they decreed, it was official uh, proclamation by those in authority not to preach in the name of Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine an effort to prevent people from hearing the word of God? That's part of the cause why we have a famine. Also, the Reformation. What, was the Bible banned? during the time of the Reformation, where it was against the law to have and to read it. That was church and state coming together. Superhuman effort. And there is a power that was working behind uh, these misguided men to keep God's word from reaching the people. In fact, there was a priesthood. And the priesthood, since they couldn't keep the Bible from getting into the hands of the common people, the priests had devised a, a, a fable, a myth that said, you can't read it. You can't study it. You don't understand it. You have to come to us. Let the priesthood, 
let us read the word of God to you. And then our interpretation is what you need to listen to. Brothers and sisters, that has been uh, the, uh, the plan of the enemy of God from the very beginning to keep the word away from the people. How about in this day and age? How about in this generation? Let me read to you from the book Evangelism, page 230. It says, Satan has devised a state of things whereby the proclamation of the third angel's message shall be bound about. Bound, that's chained. Did, didn't Paul speak about being bound in prison? We're t he tells us, I believe it's in the book of uh, 2 Timothy. Before he says, I'm, I'm ready to give my life. I'm ready to be offered up. He knew he was going to perish. He knew he was going to die. 2 Timothy 2.9, he says, even though I suffer in prison, and even though I am bound, he says, the word of God is not bound. Praise the Lord. And we're told in Evangelism 2.30 that Satan wants to bound the three angels' messages. Can you imagine that? She says, there must be no toning down of the truth, no muffling of the message for this time. The third angel's message must be strengthened and confirmed. That's why it is my desire that the faith that God has given to us for this time be affirmed in our life, that we can go away with a renewed desire to not just understand and allow that to transform our lives, but that we can, by God's grace, can preach and share it with other people. Let me read another one, Great Controversy 607. It says, the controversy will extend into new fields, and the minds of the people, that's talking about this generation, will be called to God's downtrodden law. Who's gonna do that work? Who's gonna bring attention to this generation that God has a standard, he has a banner that is inscribed with the commandments of God and what else? The faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. Who's going to lift that standard up? Brother, that's the work of the remnant people. That's the work of God's people in this hour. And she says that as this work is being fulfilled, she says, state Satan is astir. Great Controversy 607. And what's going to happen? He says the clergy, that's, that's those who refuse to allow the word of God in its purity, unmixed with human tradition, to reach the world. Notice, the clergy will put forth almost superhuman effort. It will be superhuman effort because it will be Satan who is astirred who will use misguided people to do what? To shut away the light. At least it should shine upon their flocks. By every means and at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. Have you seen any of that? Have you heard of the cancel culture? Have you seen how certain, certain things, certain truths, certain moral teachings, oh, we can't, we can't allow those things on social media, you, you can allow everything else. You can allow a floodgate of iniquity, but certain truths that defend the principles of God's law, it's not even my view. I don't have a view on the moral issues, but God does. And what his law says, what does his law say? It's not just the Sabbath, my brothers and sisters. Read the commandments. There's one about life. Is there a commandment that protects life? Yes. Is there a commandment there that defines and that protects the institution of marriage? Is there something in, in the Ten Commandments that, that's there? Yes, my brothers. But certain things, those issues, oh, we can't talk about those things. There's a cancel culture that will not allow those things to be uh, taught. You know, brothers, because the devil knows what those truths will cause. The devil knows that the everlasting gospel, if it is preached in its purity, will set you free from the things of this world. Oh, the devil knows that. 
And he is doing everything he can to prevent this word that tells us what right and wrong is, that defines to us what God requires in this generation, what he expects from us, how Christ will blot away my sins if I turn them over to him. The source of truth, which will fact check all the stuff that we hear coming down from the top. You know, you talk about fact checking things, brother, this will fact check whether what the church leaders, what polit politicians, whether they're telling us the truth or whether they're trying to sell us a false dream and a false hope. So yes, brothers, we have a standard that will expose the lies, that will expose the tyranny that men are conspiring to impose upon this earth. There's a reason why there's a famine in the land. There's a superhuman effort to keep this word. For, brothers, there's no other book that has been preserved. There's no other truth that has been so attacked. And after thousands of years of being attacked since the Garden of Eden, God's word has been under attack. It's still here today. And Jesus, looking at the last generation, says this conflict will reach a boiling point. In fact, during the thousand of years, uh, there's been such great opposition. But what did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Isn't Matthew 24 the signs of the last days? Yes, brothers. And as Jesus gives all the signs of the nations and of the famines, pestilence, wars, he says in Matthew 24, verse 23, in spite of all that, he says, heaven and earth will pass away. But what about, the, what about his word? What about his message? His everlasting gospel? What's going to happen? It shall not pass away. The word will still be proclaimed. The word will still be taught in its purity, just as Jesus did in his day. You know, where, where's the ancient Roman Empire today? Where are the Caesars that did all they could to shut down and to suppress and to stop the word of God? Where are they today? They're gone. Where's every ancient civilization? Where are all those people who rebelled against God's word? Where are they? They're all gone. God, but what about God's word? It's still here. And it will always be here. And after this world, listen, friends. After this world passes away, God's word will triumph through eternity. So don't, don't pick a fight with inspiration. Don't try to challenge and argue and become the arbiter and the judge of what God has said. Friends, this book, too many things have come to pass already. And so as we see things being fulfilled, we need to recognize as Paul did when he was sitting in prison. Imagine that. Here's a prisoner in chains who knows he's about to, to die and be offered. Yet he could still pray to his God. He could still write. He could still prophesy. He could still praise his God from a prison cell. Why, brothers? Why? Because even though he was locked up, the word said he was free in Christ Jesus. And even though we may not be in that situation just yet, but should it come to us, we ought to be working with an undiminished spirit, with the zeal to teach God's word. Through, though Paul was suffering, yet his imprisonment in no way, and here's the good news, Weaken the power of the word of God and the preaching of the gospel. And, the, and our circumstances, our, whatever situation we are found in, does not prevent the gospel from fulfilling God's purpose. Because there is one found in these pages. There is someone who is able to give us a joy when all we can see is sorrow. Amen. There is someone who, even though 
we feel disheartened and discouraged, he is a source of our courage and our joy and our peace. And the word of Christ, Christ is exemplified and expressed in this word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, you, we all know it. In the beginning was what? The word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And what about verse 14? About the flesh. What does the Bible say in verse John 1, 14 about the word and flesh? It says the word became flesh. Brothers, this is a revelation of Christ. You know, we talk about relationships. You want to, you want to have a relationship with Christ? Relationships are based on communication, right? It, okay, let me ask this. Is uh, communication important in relationships? <laughs> you better believe it. And some people say, well, we, we don't want dogmatics. You know, we, we don't want uh, doctrine. Very popular today. We don't want to focus on what the, the letters. We just want to have a relationship with Jesus. We just want to focus on his love. Relationship. Well, how can you have a relationship if we're not listening to him who speaks to us through the word? And how, how do you even know about God? How, how do you even know that God is love? How do you know? If it's not the word that tells us that God is love. How would you know anything about God, who he's like, what he does, what he did, if we don't go to the word to find out what's there? And most importantly, how can you have a relationship with someone if we don't know what he said? The world wants Jesus, but they don't want what he said, what he taught. Brothers and sisters, we crucify Christ again if he was in this generation. What we do, here's what we do. On Thursday, we'll praise Hosanna when he does a miracle. And when he can heal the, the sick and raise the dead. We'll praise him. But the moment he begins to open his lips and teach and instruct us with the truths of all eternity, we'll say crucify him. We don't want the doctrine. We don't want dogmatics. When I say dogmatics, I'm not talking about puppies, okay? I'm not talking about puppies. I'm talking about the teachings of God's word. The world says, brothers and sisters, it's happening today. The churches are all coming together. And they're saying, leave your doctrine at the door. We're just going to come together and build a human fraternity, a universal order. And it's only going to be based on love. That's it. We, we don't want doctrine. Brothers, sisters, what are we doing with, with God's precious truth? There's a famine in the land, my brothers. There's a famine. Some say, I believe that Sunday is the Lord's day. Really? Well, where'd you hear that? Where'd you read it? What book is it in? Is it in the book of uh, first suppositions or second speculations? What book it is, is it in? What does God say? How can you have a relationship with someone if you don't hear what they have to say to us and the instructions that God has given to us? It's the same serpent that challenged God's word. It's the same spirit that is working today that has produced a famine in the land. Yes, the famine is fast approaching, the one that's coming when probation closes, but it's here. And no, it's not, maybe it's not like in the time of Jeremiah where they would burn the scroll or in the time of uh, the Reformation where, you know, they would uh, forbid men by uh, destroying the written word, but it's more subtle. It's more deceptive because they're corrupting the teachings that are contained therein. They're twisting them and replacing them with human inventions 
human philosophy. Uh, and the prophet says, a famine is from hearing the word of God. That's where the issue is. They want a relationship. They want to focus on the love of God, but they don't want to hear the word of God. And so what good does it do, my brothers? Think about this. What good does it do to have the Bible and just have it simply lying in the shelf all week long? Gathering dust. What good is a printed word of God, which came to us at such a great expense, except there be a desire in our life and in our heart to read it, to apply it in my life, and to profit from the instructions that God has given us? Oh, brothers and sisters, listen, it'll tell you about economy. When there was no economy, I mean, you remember Joseph through God. And Joseph didn't come up with the system, but God told Joseph to the king of Egypt, listen, take one-fifth. Those of you who are good in math, what's one-fifth? How much percent is that? 20%. What does that mean? It means don't live off 100% of your income. Like Congress right now. They want to raise the debt ceiling. You know what that means? They want to spend more money than what's actually coming in. They're doing the opposite to what God told the king of Egypt. Imagine that, giving economic advice. And did Egypt do pretty good? Oh, brothers, because they followed God's simple plan of not living off 100%. Some of us want to live on 110%. Some of, you know, what had Egypt owned all the gold. When men and nations had no more wheat. They gave all the gold to Egypt. And they, by following God's word, they were able to be on top. And isn't that true today with us? The Bible doesn't just tell you how to save and plan and earn. It tells you about history, right? It tells you about relationships, marriage, children, it talks about everything that has to do with our life that we can, uh, the Bible says that you may live and prosper in the land which I give you. So brothers and sisters, the present day famine exists and describes the spiritual indifference, lethargy that exists in this age, just before Jesus comes. You know, the world doesn't even know whether Jesus is coming. That's part of the famine. The world doesn't know how to be ready when Jesus comes. The world doesn't know that the God, when Jesus comes, he will have a reward to give to every man according to what he has done in this world. That means that a judgment has taken place and he comes to bring a reward. The world doesn't know that. The world doesn't know the events in connection to the close of probation. And especially what God expects for, from us to be ready. Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the three angels' messages will tell you how to be ready so that you can meet Jesus in the clouds of heaven as a friend. So you can be ready to meet him. And, but tragically, just as the people weren't ready for his first coming. Were they ready for the first coming? Brothers, they, did, did they know the year he was going to be born? Daniel 9? Did they know the year? Did they know the town he was going to be born in? Brothers, there was over 300 prophecies. Did they know what he was going to do? Did they know there would be miracles? Did they know it was the life of Christ not all prophesied and he fulfilled everything to the letter? They knew everything. In fact, when he finally came to people who were waiting for him for thousands of years, they rejected him. Why, brothers? Why? There was a famine for the word of God. And just as they weren't ready, the world wasn't ready. It wasn't just the world, my brothers. These were those who were supposed to be the depositories 
of God's law. Those who were supposed to be announcing the advent of the Lord, they weren't themselves ready. And so it will happen again that the generation who are waiting for him to go, to return in this second generation, the second time, the second advent, we will be entrenched in doubt and unbelief. Let me read Christ's Object Lessons 228. It says, the world is perishing for want of the gospel. There is a famine for the word of God. Colossians, not Colossians, Christ's Object Lessons, page 228. She says, there's a famine and the world is perishing for the gospel. Which gospel? What? There's so many gospels. There's an ecumenical gospel. Don't focus on, you know, don't, don't. God is not that particular on what day I go to church. God is not that particular about what I eat and drink. He's not, really? Where do you get that from? Who said that? What did, what did God tell Adam and Eve? When they said, Lord, but we were naked and ashamed, so we hid ourselves. God says, who told you you were naked and ashamed? Who, who, are you listening to me, to my word? Or are you listening to something else? Who told you God isn't that particular? H how do you know? There's only one way to find out. You have to go to the word. And so what's gospel, brothers? We're told through inspiration, the world is perishing because they don't have the gospel. Oh, but they, they've made their own gospel, the ecumenical gospel, the social gospel, where all we do is we give man a piece of bread, but we don't give him the bread of life. You know, we, and there's nothing wrong with giving them the things, you know, to heal people. But how about healing them from the power of sin so they can have everlasting life? How about that? And then there's what the world calls the rainbow gospel. We're not going to get into that. But there's so many variations. The world needs the everlasting gospel. The gospel that God himself preached in the Garden of Eden. That says, I will put enmity between your seed and the serpent seed. How many seeds? Two. How many humanities? Two. How many parties? Two. But the world says, no, 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 no. There's not two humanities. There's only one. And we're all part of the same. We're all going to heaven. You know, you can, all the different spiritualities are different expressions of the same God. And brothers, the world has its own gospel, and they're perishing. There's a famine, she says. Cross object lessons continues. There are few who preach the word unmixed with human traditions. Few. That's why there's a famine today, because there's few who preach the word. Though men have the Bible in their hands, they do not receive the blessings that God has placed in it for them. Are there blessings? If I apply what's here, yes, not just in this life. You know, the, God says, I've given you all these instructions that it may go well with thee, that thou mayest prosper. If we, if we all followed this, we wouldn't need police. We wouldn't need prison systems. We wouldn't need attorneys, praise the Lord, right? We wouldn't need judges. We wouldn't have to lock our doors if man would follow what's here. But it's because men have not that we have, what is it, over 700 billion that goes to defense spending, and it's still not enough. We have enough agencies, there's still not enough. There's no amount of stuff that you can do when it's human nature. You can't restrain. They couldn't restrain Satan in heaven. You couldn't. You couldn't reform him. They tried. They pled. And no amount of spending is going to bring about the utopia 
unless the gospel of Christ is implanted inside our lives. When Christ is born within, then all my feelings change. When the gospel penetrates this hard head of mine, then it gives me new desires. Have you heard of a new birth? The Bible, Jesus says, unless a man is born again. Have you heard where it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. What does that mean? All the old things pass away. Praise God, right? Is that good for me? Is that good for my wife? Is it good for my neighbors and my church? If the old, ugly things pass away. And then the new principles of heaven, which does include love. It does include love. But it doesn't leave it to me to define what love is. Because love is more than just a serpy, sentimental feeling. I can promise you that. If you look at the divorce rate, it's more than just a feeling. Love is a principle. Love means respect. It means that you care and that you provide. And it's demonstrated by deeds and actions. Anyways, uh, so the famine is coming. Christ's object lessons. And we'll close with this. There's another famine that's bigger. When probation closes. When probation closes. In fact, uh, what we read in Amos chapter, what was it? Chapter 9? Chapter 8, verses uh, 11 and 12, that has a direct application to the close of probation. Let me read that to you. It says from, I'm reading from a Great Controversy, 628, 629. She says the plagues, that's the seven last plagues. The plagues, are, the plagues fall when the gospel work is, is, has ended. She says the plagues are not universal or the inhabitants of the earth would be wholly cut off. Yet they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortal man. You know, we look at the wars, look at the hurricanes, right? Look at the social distress, look at the conflicts, look at the problems. Brothers, that's nothing. Let me tell you why. She says, all the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation, the earthquakes, riots, wars. What about all those things before probation closed? have been mingled with mercy. Probation is still open. God in his mercy allows circumstances that will cause us to go to our knees so that we can seek repentance through any other means. You know, God knows what eternal life is worth. He knows the risk. He knows the price of a soul. He says, what will you give? Even if you gain the whole world, what will it profit if you lose your soul? He knows the value of your soul. And sometimes if you're not reading, if you're not praying, if you're not studying, sometimes he'll allow a crisis to cause you to stop what you're doing so that you can consider and think and say, Lord, help me, help me. He knows, and he's not going to, he'll do everything he can to save our lives. So yes, we have judgments. Yes, we have conflicts. But those are mingled with God's mercy. But when probation closes, oh, brothers and sisters, God help this world. If we don't have the seal of the living God, if we are not found in Christ, sealed in his protection, under his, what does it say? He who uh, abides in the shadow of the Almighty. If we're not sealed at that time, she goes on to say, uh, all the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinners from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, when the seven last plagues fall, she says, they will be poured out unmixed with mercy. In that day, multitudes will desire the shelter of God's mercy. It's, it's available now. You remember the, remember the ark? Mo, uh, Noah, he preached his heart and soul for the people to get in. And he pled with them. 
But the day came when he made the last invitation and the door was shut. A door was shut. And she talks about in that day, when it started to rain, did the people want in at that time? Did they change their mind when they heard lightning for the first time? And they, heard, they saw lightning and heard thunder? Did they change their mind? Yes. Did they say, you know what, maybe we ought to get in the ark. What do you say? I think it was unanimous. Men, will see, men, saw, men and women sought to get in when it started to rain. But it was too late. And we're told again, multitudes will desire shelter. You may not desire it now, but I promise you, in times, remember 9-11? What happened on 9-12? Everybody was in church. Everybody was in church trying to f- say, Lord, help us. Save. A year went by and everyone went back to doing their same, same routine. She says, and then notice how she closes that. She says, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. She, she quotes Amos 8, 11 and 12. She links that period with the famine. They're going to go north and south, east and west, seeking comfort. They will not receive it. What will the people be doing? Early writings, page 8, 282. Many of the wicked were enraged as they suffered the effects of the plagues. It was a scene of fearful agony. Notice, parents, in other words, those who were lost, those on the outside. And, and this happened in the days of Noah too, a small window. Parents were bitterly reproaching their children and children their parents, brothers or sisters, and sisters or brother. What happened to the, the unity? Unity without Christ. What happened to the unity in sin? What about the festive, the parties, you know, the feasting and the eating and the drinking and the merrymaking? No more. No more. And what did they say? What did they say? It was you who kept me from receiving the truth, which would have saved me from this awful hour. They did this at the time of the flood. They became enraged and they blamed everybody else except themselves for not heeding the warning. And notice, the people turned to their ministers with bitter hate and reproach, saying, You have not warned us. You told us that all world would be converted and cried peace and peace to quiet every fear. Brothers, that's what they're saying now. Peace, peace, unity, utopia. That's what they're predicting now. That's what they're trying to create now. They're actually going to bring the greatest crisis this world has seen when they say Sunday for the environment, a day for the creation to save us from all the, the pandemic and the plague and the, the climate crisis. We need Sunday for the environment. It's written in the, it's written in the, the, the documents that they're promoting. The Sunday is written in there. We're not making anything up. This is not a conspiracy. It's there if you want to read it. And the ministers, their churches, will turn on their ministers, says, you have not told us this. And she concludes by saying, I saw that the ministers did not escape the wrath of God. Their suffering was tenfold greater than the people. Listen, brothers, we hear people say, well, I don't like your preaching, Andy. Don't worry. Soon you will never hear another admonition ever again. Soon. You'll never hear anybody tell you, to turn around. When probation closes, the Lord will not work on anybody to go and preach the gospel and to encourage our brothers to do the right thing. Children say to their parents, I don't want you correcting me. You're always trying to tell me how to do things. Soon our parents will never say another word. That time is coming. Soon. I tremble for our people. But we have a sacred obligation, especially if you assume this sacred desk here, to talk to the people. We have a solemn duty, and parents have that same duty too. To say what God says on the issues. To preach what Jesus preached on this. To share what God's word tells us to share. And it's better 
for people to get angry at you now. Let them get mad at you. Let them say you're not Christ-like, even though you're just telling people what Christ said. You know, Christ isn't Christ-like by some people's standard. Read Matthew 23. Boy, that's a tough chapter. I'm still working on preaching a sermon on Matthew 23, the woes to the scribes and Pharisees. But I have to get a plane ticket because if I preach that, I'm going to have to leave the country and still watch my back. That's the strongest exhortation ever given in all the scriptures. Jesus' sermon of Matthew 23. We, have you heard a sermon on that? No. Nope. But yet Jesus gave that. And why did he give those strong rebukes? Because somebody was going to listen. He knew. And when you look at the book of Acts, you see the Pharisees became part of the church of God. He knew that somebody would listen. So it's better for the world or for the, to get pushback from even our people if they say, you know what, you're not being Christ-like. I don't like what you're saying. It's better for them to get angry with you now, to get mad at you now. That's okay because it's better than in the day of judgment when the plagues fall to say, you didn't tell me the truth. You didn't tell me that this was coming and I'm lost because of you. I'm lost. Brothers, we'll have blood on our hands. Read Jeremiah 3. Read Jeremiah 33. I'm sorry, Ezekiel 3 and Jer Ezekiel 33. Brothers, but praise the Lord, today it's not too late. Today is not too late. Today we can avoid the coming famine and the present famine. We can avoid it by God's grace. Today we can partake of the bread of life, and which, is a, which is the word of God, which is Christ exemplified, Christ made flesh in his word. Today we can have the manna that came down from heaven, the true manna. All our yearnings, all our thirst, all our hungers, the emptiness, that big void in our heart that you try to fill with money and stuff and, and pleasures that will never be satisfied because you were created to be inhabited by God Almighty. And until you have that experience, we will yearn and desire. Solomon said, I had women. Did he have women? He had a thousand women, didn't he? Were they just average girls or were they princesses? They're the most beautiful women of the world. A thousand. Did that make him happy? He wanted to kill himself. He hated his life. It meant nothing to him. And he said, the conclusion is fear God and keep his commandments. That is our duty. That gives us fulfillment and purpose and meaning in life. Oh, brothers and sisters, we could be filled today. We could be satisfied today. Jesus said, my words, my word is spirit and they are life. Everlasting life. And we can have spiritual life today by the grace of God. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you're still working in our lives and that you still desire to reconcile us in spite of ourselves. Oh, Father, may your gospel have its complete way in our life. May it transform us and bring us to our knees and bring us to the cross so that you can begin to work in us and make something beautiful and fit us and prepare us to go and share this wonderful message with everyone. We thank you, Lord, for this church and for this congregation. We thank you, Lord, for this precious truth that we have been privileged, a truth and a message and a generation that every other preacher of righteousness, beginning with Enoch, down to the times of our pioneers, they all dreamed and prayed and wished they could live in this day. But yet you've called us for such a time. We thank you, Lord, and we ask all these blessings, not because we're worthy, but because you have called and you will prepare us for this great work. We thank you and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.